How do humans? It's Timothy here. Welcome to the Rediscover Human podcast. So today's subject and topic for our discussion is one I I actually didn't want to do another podcast until next year, if I'm honest. I was kind of in a, a different space and thought I'd just take time off. Um, but I kind of felt this theme came to me and I thought, oh, maybe I should do that for a podcast. Um, and I kind of, but then I kind of brushed it off and I thought, oh, I've got other things to focus on. I'm not, I don't feel like talking and preparing a podcast and going on about that. Then the other night I woke up at 4 a.m. Um, and I turned to the chapter in my book. It was one of those where you wake up and it's happened a few times lately where I wake up and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be awake for an hour or something like that. So I turned to my book, um, which I'm really enjoying at the moment. And it was exactly the topic that I was going to do the, this talk on. And the, these chapters are in this book. It's like a 600 page book. And the chapters are all about two to three pages long. And it just happened to be this chapter. Literally the title was on this subject. So um, I thought, okay, yeah, I get that, get the message. And then there's a few other few kind of serendipitous uh, uh, occasions that happened that led me to be like yeah okay i get i get the message guys i get the message let's let's put this out um and so the topic for today is the antidote to fear um it's going to be the the focus we're, we're going to get into that in a second but essentially for me i kind of came to to my own conclusion of the antidote for fear um through my physical practice which is I, when i reflect back i find that kind of beautiful that the physical practice i i grew up doing helped me to face my fear and that was that's parkour or free running for those that may not know was my main hobby throughout my teens and 20s and um, where you you know you jump off walls and you're you're and it's not you know often people on the outside may perceive it as reckless but it's really uh, you know a discipline of precision and coordination and knowing your body and um yeah really learning to know your own limits in a in a safe and controlled manner that if for those that don't practice it it does look it may look you know dangerous or whatever but for many of us doing it it's just a a, a beautiful passion now obviously it gets used in other ways and can be used to show off and all sorts come into it and competitively um which i myself competed um but in its raw essence and the pure form of the people that founded it um, be strong to be useful parkour is such a beautiful uh, practice and what i noticed was often I'd be I'd be free running and someone would just say oh you're fearless and I, it always kind of perturbed me a little bit because I always felt like it was a projection they, they kind of wanted meant reckless but fearless is kind of a nicer way of saying reckless like oh, you've just got no fear that you can try that whereas because they would have fear trying that but I thought no I, it's not that I've got no fear I, I do feel fear but I've just got faith in in my body and in my you know what my body can do and I know my body's limits well um, faith and I learned to have faith even more so even in my intentions and I wasn't a, a perfect faith but it was if I was doing a movement that I believed I could do like say a, a jump between two railings or something and I had my intentions were for my experience and for me to overcome it or break that jump as they, they say I felt much more uh, so I felt more protected in that scenario than if I was doing a, a flip or something to film it to make a video to put out on the internet to sh sort of show off or like look at the tricks I can do I felt more protected in those pure moments with no camera that was just me and and the experience and and my own faith in my ability and, and not to prove anything to anyone so that was my kind of f felt like my first dive into faith um so that for me became this is my my perspective my opinion the antidote to fear is faith now we're going to get into what that actually means and you know all the in a, in a more um <clears throat> spiritual sense not just that was my physical lesson to learn and i kind of like that about the universe that we're in right now is you can learn spiritual lessons through physical practices and i think maybe many people listening have noticed that as well in their lives so what does faith do then um it essentially like i said it lessens fear and less fear equals you know more more peace in our lives it, because it it brings us helps us to become more patient and feel less frustration um if we're more peaceful we feel less frustrated right um it brings us to more compassion and we're able to uh, be more forgiving if we're more peaceful and it gives us clarity and discernment because we're not so um, wound up and invested in moments that we're able to just see things clearer when we're not 
you know, heated in the moment, emotionally, emotions swirling. You can't see things and react uh, from a more balanced place. So peace brings us clarity and discernment, which you could call wisdom. Um, and all these things, the patience, compassion and wisdom, generally t- tend to equal more love. Um, quite clearly, if we're acting, if we're being more patient with people and we're more compassionate towards them and, and we're wiser with that, the way we live, that's going to be bring us about a more loving life, being, being a more loving person. Um, and so what is faith? I'm going to touch on this a little bit and then I'm going to go into some kind of my, more my story how I've built my faith to where I feel like I'm at today. Um, and this isn't preaching like someone who's solved it and got all the answers, but I, I came to recognize actually literally just yesterday, I was like, actually like that probably is one of, there's a lot of, we all have, um, kind of spiritual strengths and weaknesses, you know, depending on how much you've, you've gone into stuff. Um, and I th- and I'd, I'd honestly have to say, like being love is is a harder one for me to crack that I'm working my way through now. But faith is something that I feel is one of probably one of my strongest spiritual attributes that I've somehow had and carried. Um, so it's feel like it's something that yeah, I just realised that there's actually yeah, I've got so maybe I'm the right not the perfect person to speak on it, but I've got some. I feel like I've got some things to offer. So I'm going to get into my kind of story of that and what what uh, kind of advice potentially I could offer people not not yeah just just go through that but um so just first I'm going to touch on a few things what faith is and then we'll get into more nuts and bolts of my story and then we yeah then we'll come back to it um so it's kind of an inner it's like an inner knowledge it's not like a it's not a blind belief uh, it's it's a it's an inner knowledge, like an inner knowing that can't be taught, which is what I find so beautiful about it. It's like you cannot, you have to experience it in your life. You have to consciously observe the happenings in your life with a bird's eye view in a way and be a really observant and it develops through patient observation, basically. And yeah, I don't think... Um, faith should be should be blind um it's it's more than a belief so you can be guided towards it given like i said you can't be taught but i think you can be guided towards it given your your own personal desires for it and the right tutelage you know they say um someone can show you the door but they can't kind of walk through it for you i can't remember if i butchered that quote but it's something like that like it could take you to the, the door you know you could take a horse to the, the river or whatever but um <laughs> but yeah that's what any what i'm gonna kind of gonna attempt to do is not necessarily teach you but just to kind of show you give you just get that your mind whirling in that kind of direction about this topic which i found so much value in um so faith is it's a perception tool of the soul and this is one of the things that was in the chapter in the book that it came up with that it's a perception tool of the soul so kind of like sight for your eyes for your material body faith kind of is kind of like eyes for the soul to to see and perceive and know um what's in 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 sorry i just knocked the headphone thing out so so it's a perception tool of the soul. Um, it can be used to perceive truth, um, but greater faith deepens our perception of truth. So you can perceive truth, and the greater your faith, the deeper you're able to then perceive truth. Faith is not exclusive to religious people, uh, despite what not everyone thinks this, but many people might think that faith and religion is kind of, they're in the same pardon is not at all exclusive to just religious people you can have you cannot be in a religion or feel religious at all you can still have faith um it's available to all people children criminals from children to criminals and even child criminals it's available to just sorry terrible joke but uh, (laughs) it's it's available to everyone um it's, it's like a muscle that can be strengthened when worked with sincerity so you see people in the gym 
and they're just going through the motions. You see some people just, they'll do 20 reps on a machine, not break a sweat. The first rep will look as easy as the last rep, and then they'll move on to another machine, and they'll do 20 reps on that, that machine. They're not really sincerely working out. They may think they may just think they just need to go through the motions. But if your muscles aren't getting fatigued, you're not really developing anything. So faith is like that. It's got to be sincerely worked, not just potted about with. And it's the long, slow reps that 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 determine you know that growth, that hyper, hypertrophy that you might want. Um, faith creates humility. So with faith you one thing that you will do is you like act less desperate or less desperation in life Uh, you'll have less judgment of other people because you know the journey and what it takes that you've been on to get to where you are so then you'll have less judgment of other people and where they are on their journey um and this one's a bit more kind of cliche but faith gives you the strength to carry on if you can kind of know um have faith in what in ha- what is happening right now and when times are down it does just it can just be that one little bit of light at the end of the tunnel that you just need just to get through um and the more you get through occasions the old this too shall pass the more you have faith that you will get through so it's the experience you know kind of grows on itself and on that that note that's that's another one i wrote faith begets more faith so it does it does exactly that it builds faith builds on itself and it grows um and this is one quote another quote from the book that i was reading faith walks hand in hand with trust and i think that's kind of self-explanatory really trust if you have you know, it's trust is and yeah is faith they walk hand in hand together and if you know if you lose trust you kind of lose faith in whatever that is a person or whatever so how i my journey through faith how i kind of built my faith um just sharing because it it may help you especially at times like we're in right now um and i want to tell you what to think but how to think in a sense if i can just to find your own conclusions or just some ideas maybe for you to try in your life um yeah so when i was younger i was raised sort of Christian. My, my dad was atheist my mother went to church i wouldn't necessarily say we're christian it's not really a strong but doesn't seem like a strong believer but we went to church like a you know a good family in a sense and i went to sunday school um at church so the elders were in the main hall of the church singing hymns and the children were in a different smaller room and we were just kind of learning stories about jesus and a few other things and it did pique my curiosity in a sense that like hearing the stories about Jesus, like he just seemed like a nice guy and just the morals of what they taught <clears throat> looking back, you know, they've, they felt good. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it did instill a few things in me. I'm not, not so sure, but there were, there were, it was a loving place, that church. It wasn't judgmental. It wasn't preachy. It wasn't a, a preaching a wrathful God or anything like that. It was just very kind of loving. And I do, did appreciate that. Um, looking back. But I didn't feel any faith from it. I wouldn't say I felt any faith. I didn't say I feel a connection to God in that moment. Um, I wasn't, yeah, it didn't didn't spark me into religion. And and once I got older, as a teenager, I just could, I could choose not to go. I stopped going. I would go occasionally at Christmas, maybe Easter, um, but that was about it. Um, But then fast forward to then, you know, my teenage years, 20s, and I, as I shared the story earlier about parkour, free running i feel like that taught me a lot of faith in myself in my body um in the in the power of my will essentially you know my, like my desire physically to do something and and overcome fear it, really, it taught me a lot about overcoming fear in the physical sense um with faith pretty much directly you know um it gave me as i got sorry as i got older um from parkour i kind of grew into more uh because that's kind of very city based i got into kind of mountaineering a bit more after that chapter i got into running and then trail running and then kind of mountaineering and hiking and that really started to build me an an appreciation of nature uh, which sort of in a sense started to develop a faith in nature through that because i you know i changed my diet i started to look into more whole foods diet from all the processed food and snacks i was eating and felt better on that 
um, started learning about bare feet and, you know, connected to the earth bare feet and a lot of the science with grounding and things like that, nature. Um, and just a, things, a respect for things the way they they were. And I, at that point, I started to see kind of the disconnect of society from nature and how much uh, disease and ill health there was. And as my health got a bit better, as I turned towards nature and I could just, it just, you know, through that experience, I just got to see a clearer picture of like how little people feel responsible for their ill health when they eat what they eat and yet they go to hospitals and doctors and expect them to fix them with other stuff that's just <laughs> chemically made and it just, I don't know it just felt really logical to me it wasn't much of a struggle to to kind of step out of that the box or the matrix so to speak and that was sort of a turning point in in my life because it kind of accelerated me then once you I kind of had that disconnection and was able to then go okay well yeah nature seems pretty awesome um and it's got things figured out and it's not shouting and trying to advertise and all this stuff and i remember uh, my friend seb gave me the book celestine prophecy and i was reading it in my bed which was on the floor at the time because i was part of that nature discovery was like yeah well beds aren't even natural like i can sleep on the floor and i was enjoying my bed on the floor when i say bed literally it wasn't a mattress i would i would lie on one quilt and have another quilt on top of me um and the Celestine, and I may bring up this book a few times because this kind of was a big spark at the start of my spiritual journey, and I still recommend that book now. But um, the nine insights into life is what the book's about, and it's in a, done in a kind of fiction story way. But the insights feel like very truthful. And so the first insight in that book is there is no coincidences, and that just that one insight alone was something that I was around the time. And it's amazing when you literally when you turn to spirituality, how often. The, the funny thing that there was a coincidence that I was noticing coincidences and then the book talks about there's no coincidences and it was just like boom and that's so often how spirituality works is when you you turn towards it like I say you will notice synchronicities happen that line up with your thoughts or your questions in your head and 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 things in books or lessons or YouTube videos that you're watching it will just suggested videos will come up that are exactly the theme that you need when you're asking for that kind of when you're searching with those questions. And so I felt like I'd observed this quite often in my life, these these lack these like coincidences that I felt like, well, that's not that's too much of a coincidence to just be a coincidence, you know. And I'd, I'd noticed that they were more frequent when I felt like I was in a happier and a more peaceful place myself, personally. And so that was, you know, kind of an interesting thing to know. Oh, when I'm in a better place, more synchronicities happen in my life. So there's kind of a evidence there that I'm you know, I'm on the right path. Um and so for me, I think this is a really good starting point that that worked for me. I can't, other people might have a different starting point for them into, into spirituality, but that was a good one was to recognize synchronicities and just get a sense that they're like, that these very obvious events in your life, in my life, that they're, they're tangible to you, but they might not be to others. And that's, that's where you have to go it alone with this faith is again like i said earlier it's like you can't be taught it has to be experienced by the person and so you will have synchronicities where they're so tangible to you and they feel so mind-blowing <laughs> and you tell them to a friend and they're just like oh yeah cool like and they're like they're not as stoked as you are it doesn't seem as crazy to them as to you but it was for you that's the thing that experience that you noticed was was for you so that's a great starting point i find is, yeah there's no coincidences if you can recognize that then then you that's kind of an underlying invisible thread at play in life and it's the start of the breadcrumb trail that's left there if we look for it um to start to follow that and that there's a game at play behind this the material one that we're given that we grew up in that many of us grew up in there's so much of our attention caught into this this material one like more than ever everything's vying for our attention and yet if you can unplug from that and take a step back and zoom out you can see that there's there's a game behind the game and that's these little clues that creep through like synchronicities are, are those winks kind of from god or you know one of my favorite quotes at the time was when i heard it coincidence is god's way of remaining anonymous 
I really like that. It was kind of like a wink from God, in a sense, or spirits, you know, whoever at this point, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, from spirits through, from God through spirits or whatever. Um, anyway, you can, you can, that alone, we don't have to get, necessarily have to get to that belief of that, but just to wreck it, just helped me recognize that there is maybe a higher power, maybe a creator or a designer to this place or something else, you know, that's, that's beyond just what we're given and what we can see. We all know like how limited our perspective is and what our senses are just, you know, sense five things that are going off, but we can't sense Wi-Fi with our, with our bodies and it, you know, just because we can't, can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so yeah, you have to feel into those moments. Um, and I, I think I've also felt a growing dissatisfaction in kind of mainstream society's approach to so many things, like I said before, with health. Um, how many addictions are recognized in most people, the, the obvious ones to me at the time, the physical ones, and just a general unhappiness and lots of unself, lots of selfishness and um, disconnection from environment and kind of environmentalism is like just not much respect paid, especially at this time. You know, there's a lot more talk of it now, not that that's, it's necessarily even sincere, but they're talking about it now at least. Um, but even back then I just was like, what am I, how can we just treat this place this way and just be not like no one cares and just trust that the people with the most pull and say, we just trust that they're actually mature, making mature adult decisions for the planet that are, that are looking after the thing. And it's just <laughs> didn't seem quite as obvious when you like look behind the curtain. Um, but yeah, you, I just always had that thought that everyone's kind of doing their best. Everyone's, all these big people, the government and everyone running things have got the best interests at heart. And it, I think I just started to have a little bit of doubt in that and start to lose faith in kind of, kind of recognize it now as scientism, which is sort of pop culture's replacement for religion that exists right now. Where it's, it's like the most common generally accepted takes on science that just, it's all in the physical and it isolates things. Doesn't look at the, the holistic picture and it often just fights symptoms symptoms <laughs> rather than the root causes of stuff. And so that really led me to like my second point, which was just letting someone to let go of faith in the material world to fix issues. Um, just having my own uh, like knee issues and other sorts of health issues that you go to the doctors and they just give you something for or you tape something up and you're like it's not really working it feels like you're just masking the thing and just started to yeah solve problems tried to try to solve problems myself or in an alternative way of thinking because yeah you can't solve problems with the same thinking that caused them and I, I see that a lot with so much of just the capitalist thinking and like I said even the, the climate stuff they're talking about now um with COP26 going off it just seems like a lot of businesses jumping on kind of the green bandwagon, not because they actually care, but because it's good for business to have the ties in that right now. And how much, you know, are they actually changing? Are they just doing the minimum to make it look like they're doing something, but really their business is still, the train just keeps on moving and, and is destructive no matter what, you know? Um, but in this place, you kind of feel a little bit exposed and this is why I imagine most people don't kind of break through from this place where you, you, you have these questioning moments of, of society's uh, approach to life, to to health is probably the biggest one to see through, really. And so people may have these break, breaking moments of questioning it. Um, but you feel exposed if you were to go any further. So it's a lot of people maybe go back to the comfort of the material world and forget that they questioned it, you know, at least in in the short term and, you know, until the lesson next time, maybe a bigger, get bigger and bigger until for people, until they recognize it, you know, and some people that they don't recognize it in this, in this lifetime, in the physical lifetime. Um. so yeah, the next point three, you lost, you're going to, you have to lose, yeah, you have to lose yourself to find yourself. It's a quote I kind of used to like, but not just not lose yourself, like lose your mind, but lose the fake you. The, I was reading a lot of Eckhart Tolle after that, I think, and lose the ego, as he calls it, but as um, 
learn it now. I think a more accurate word for it is the facade. Um, you have to, as you lose the facade, you will feel lost. Um, but that's the facade is the one that you built to fit into that world that you're starting to let go of. And so at this point, when you're feeling, you may feel yeah, a little lost and not sure what direction to take. My advice then would just be to, I mean, I imagine a lot of people here are probably past these stages anyway, but I just wanted to I laid out the way I've done it or recognize going backwards. Um, but study, just start to study with an open mind and an open heart. Um, I started to study religions, uh, Buddhism, Islam, uh, the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, Hare Krishna and just spirituality in general, we, you know, the, the different books and the different um you know, like the Celestine Prophecy and Alchemist and that. And then even mediumship I kind of got into. I kind of enjoyed listening to that. Abraham Hicks and Bashar, Cryon I really liked, Barbara Marciniak from the Palladians. Just studying all this different stuff, not getting too attached to any one of them. Um, speaking to religious friends, speaking to some of my friends, you know, in the parkour world at the time about spirituality in general and just questions and talk about the book and reading and stuff and just to see... Some of them were, weren't receptive. Some of them were more receptive than others. And even, you know, sometimes the ones that are receptive are not necessarily the ones that you expect to be re receptive. And it's kind of a nice surprise. So studying and then also experimenting. So you're starting, a, you're starting afresh with not much foundations, not no school to go to. And, you know, even if there is kind of a, a school of this stuff online, how would you know which one to trust? You know, there's a lot of well-intended, passionate people who believe in what they know and what they're teaching, but it, many of it's, you know, still not necessarily helpful or conducive to spiritual progression. You know, really it can be you know, spiritual bypassing and all sorts. And, you know, I've, I've been caught up in, you know, I've been studied lots of kind of folks teachings and believed in them at the time. And they sounded great. And, but, you know, being, practicing yeah, discernment and being honest with myself looking you know after a few months or whatever recognizing that there was no growth in myself and and something else came along that piqued my interest and followed that and experimented with that as well instead um but I've, I've always had this kind of sense that it's okay to experiment in life and that we should experiment in life obviously the, the cost of the experiment isn't necessarily clear at the time so you try to limit um the experiments of whatever the cost is it's only really affecting me as in i'm not trying to like experiment on things that might damage other people of course it's you know it's hard to always fully know that stuff because you know for example i experimented with poly uh, polygamy for one short period because i was looking into tribes and you know they say tribes they have in the, we would have had multiple partners back in the day and um you know you would have had children in the tribe and no one would really know who the father is and that made it better because then everyone would just parent and father and mother everyone's child and so, oh that kind of sounds like a an interesting way that maybe that is the case maybe we are meant to be polyamorous um but looking back on it you know, I have, I learned from the experience that I didn't, but I didn't believe in it, but through the experience of us, actually, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> but if I didn't experiment, I may never have got to that answer. And now, you know, I kind of wish I didn't be, have to do that because it wasn't necessarily love into the, you know, the, the females involved, but, um, that's, that's an example of when, yeah, it's hard to know at the time, but you know, yeah, it wasn't the greatest cost, but I can't justify it really. Um, but lesson learned, um experimented with uh plant medicines so ayahuasca peyote uh frog cambo frog poison um it, i was more open to marijuana as an alternative to the mainstream options that were given um because you kind of go full hog the other way sometimes when you step step away from society yeah, experimented with diet I did a lot with, you know, veganism, raw veganism, juicing, fasting, etc. But, you know, this is this is a whole new world. It's a whole new set of schools and you've got no roadmap for what you're doing. 
but I felt like I was in the right ballpark. Um, at many times I felt like I had the answer. <laughs> many times I felt like I had the answer. Um, or, you know, the answer to healing, the answer to health, the solution to the, all my problems, to, you know, being enlightened and all this stuff. And yet many times I was wrong and many times I, you know, missed the mark. Um, but I tried not to attach too much to anything and, and just to remain open to correcting as we go. Although obviously, for those that know the story, it's things like with veganism, I got quite deep into that and learned some valuable lessons about self-righteousness publicly with that one. Um, but one of the one of the highlights of all that stuff that I really enjoyed actually was, was I think, was the channeled messages. Like I said, the Abraham Hicks, I kind of... Grew, not grew out of because I'd occasionally come back and I liked it but like cry on was just really you know I understand why people have a, a block to listening to mediumship or channel messages but it's I'm always open to it I've always had an opening in me that was open to hearing another person out and to just kind of use my instincts and not judge them straight away until I hear what they have to say and that works really well with channeling because I just sensed for in the message it's like do I hear an agenda in what they're trying to like I didn't hear an agenda in what they're saying and it sounded inspiring and it sounded loving and it didn't sound like what they're teaching would hurt anyone and it was just positive um it felt like it was in a more loving place than I was at and it's kind of like you're at a frequency this is what they I learned at the time as well, actually. And it made sense to me. And you just need to f find the frequency above you to, to grow. And that's why people kind of listen to music is they listen to either music kind of in the frequency that they're at or in the frequency, just above the frequency that they're at, because that kind of pulls them upwards. And that's why different music sounds different to different people at different times. So it's kind of like that. Like I was in a certain place of spiritual openness and the messages they were saying were in, could sound like they were in a more loving place and they were actually teaching me the step above where I was at. Um, and I even remember listening to like, there was a page called Rainbow Abundance that I really liked and there was all the channel messages from Archangel Michael and Gabriel and Jesus and um, channeled messages from dolphins on there and I just listened to them like at night and it was, wasn't even... A, it was like a robot voice speaking it because it was just someone had channeled it and wrote it down and then plugged it in the rainbow abundance channel. I'd probably just took them from a website, ran it through like a, a generator where the voice speaks the words automatically like automated. And that actually even helped it even more because then I didn't associate a specific human's voice with the channeled message. It was just the words. And I even came to like, like and appreciate this robot woman's voice speaking these channel messages from dolphins or whatever. Uh, Cause they, I was just, they just felt genuinely like positive messages that left me like inspired before I went to sleep. Um, but the main man himself, along with the channel messages was one that I actually returned to Jesus. Um, not necessarily, I wasn't drawn to Christianity, but just him as a human fascinated me. And I, I read, the Essene Gospels of Peace. And that was one of the most inspiring texts I ever read during that period as well. Um, and there was just some nuggets within them, like about lifestyle and stuff, along with the messages of love and forgiveness. But it said like, eat twice a day, once when the sun is highest, once when it sets. Uh, you know, don't eat more than three ingredients in a meal. And that was kind of mono mealing and things like that kind of made sense to me. So, you know, we're kind of, we have... You can call it abundance or you can call it greed and it, I don't know how you want to word it, but how many ingredients we have in every meal these days because of how much options we have. Um, but three ingredients in a meal, if you ever do that, like you just do rice, mushrooms and, you know, sweet potato or something like that, or, um, rice, mushrooms and broccoli and, you know, maybe a bit of salt, a bit of olive oil or something like that. But that's great. Actually, sometimes the more you strip back a meal, the more I, you enjoy it. Um, and it talked a lot about fasting. It was like saying like fast every one day for every year of sin that you've lived in a sense and stuff like that really, you know, struck a chord with me. Um, and he seemed different from the others. I remember listening to a really long lecture about uh, Buddha 
Mohammed, Confucius and Jesus, the four most influential people on earth. And it, well, it was like a multiple part lecture thing. And Jesus was just kind of different um, to the others. Like it just felt like that anyway. You know, obviously, if it, yeah, he, like he never intended to, from what I gather to create a religion. Like he didn't start Christianity like while he was alive and go, right, we need a new this we need to this we need to form a new religion like he taught what he taught he was a a godly man not necessarily a religious man and i think there's a difference there and he while he was alive he actually challenged religion and the the way they were doing things wrong and missing the mark um in his first century life and he was just seemed like a a humble man with one simple simple fundamental teaching that there's a creator and he loves us um, obviously other stuff that goes with that, but that was kind of the basis of it, you know, just like, you know, the computer, or the phone you listen to me on right now, it wouldn't exist if someone didn't design or invent or create it or the car that you drive, if that hadn't been invented by someone and made, you wouldn't have it. And just like that, someone designed and created you and me. This is the, the teachings, right? And just like you, when you, you're proud of something that you make, say you make a nice meal and it makes you smile and you're like, oh, I'm proud of that meal. I want other people to try this. I wish other people could try this right now. Um, or you imagine you invented something. Imagine you invented the bicycle. Imagine you invented the bicycle. Like that's a, you can, that's a tangible invention, right? A phone, you can't imagine inventing that. But bicycle, it's physical, mechanical, and like you can can see like you can see how someone invented it like you could never have done it but you can looking back you're like okay i can see how that works that goes into there oh that's cool the cogs and that goes into if you invented that and rode that for the first time and it worked you would just be so gleeful and laughing and joyous and how you would just love that bike well imagine creating the human being (laughs) and everything that goes with the human being like how much layers there are to the human, to the the biomechanics, to the spirituality, to it. Then, you know, obviously the earth as well, it goes along with that for the human to be on and animals and it goes mad. But because it, it seems incomprehensible, but if you just imagine that you invented a bike and how much you'd love it and how much you'd want to share that with humanity and other people, like if there's someone who created us, I'd imagine they'd love us very much so. And that's like, the era of earth and humanity is that we've lost that perspective or that perception and that Jesus came as one man with that awareness and was able to share that. And and though people think, Oh, well, if God loves us, why doesn't he like show us or let us see it or, you know, and I think that's one of the, can be a sticking point, but it makes sense to me that if, he loves us and he gave us free will. He wouldn't force that love onto us. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be loving. Like if you like force a hug on someone who doesn't want it, you know, you see adults do it to children often, like just forcing hugs on children and they're kind of like, yeah, okay, thanks adult. Like, like it's, it's not that loving, is it? If the other person doesn't want it, it's not that loving. So it's on, you know, it would make sense to me that if that's how it works, then maybe it's on us to open that door. Like, so it's kind of like if there's a, a our inventor, our Geppetto in the heavens, and we're like Pinocchio, and we have to come with no strings because that's the thing is, a, you can't just go okay, yep show me your love then like it's got to have a it's got to be sincere like a pure desire it's not just just a fickle one so you've got to be like pinocchio with no strings and that's not to say no sins which is a different thing but just no agenda other than to love and to be loved and then all that comes from that love or with that love that jesus demonstrated in himself you know the forgiveness the love for humanity the miracles of healing, which may not actually be miracles. It might just be our normal human capabilities. If we're, you know, a state of 
being closer to the Father, the potential for peace on earth. Maybe he found answers that no one before us had found. If those teachings are true, in my eyes, that makes him the most important scientist on earth. How to be more loving. Like how, how to have more abundant health and happiness as part of our nature without any effort. That, that is what, like, that's what we want, right? So why, like, that should be the focus of science. And yet, yet at the moment, it's not the mainstream focus. If we don't look at that. It's, it's mainstream science is so focused on the physics. It's just on the physical. And this is soul science. And until you actually commit and step into that realm, you're just you going to miss the mark. Can't see the forest for the trees. So it's soul science dealing with soul mechanics. And that seems to, as I'm learning to understand and feel in myself soul mechanics trumps the physical biology and biomechanics that's that override if you work on that level you're working at the root level of most of the suffering on earth and that's when that's why jesus had the impact he had he came with the answer to the riddle that no one knew was the riddle but it, but that could change everything that did change everything and can change everything if we can get back to those teachings and apply it potentially like this you know Anyway, back to where I'm at, as I always would ask questions in my head, randomly. Not even that I'd know they they went anywhere. Just, you know, those yeah, we all do it, right? Those pure questions you have that just go out of you, come into your head, and then they, you move on with it. You know, you might Google the answer, you might ask someone, or you just move on. Um, but sometimes I'd ask them with a, li- a little bit more curiosity to the universe, to my higher self, to ancestors, spirits, uh, to God. And sometimes I'd forget I'd even ask them. They were just fleeting pure thoughts in and out, like I wasn't attached to the answer. And then I'd notice I'd get answers. Like for the questions that I wasn't attached to knowing, I'd more often get answers. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting. Just a, ran- a random one that came to me when I was thinking about this. What, one, what examples do I have? I was wondering how do you spell heal? Because I know healing, H-E-A-L. And I was like, and I just, you know, you just have those, brain farts or whatever and I thought oh yeah the heel on a foot is that the same H-E-A-L I couldn't remember and then I was in yoga in a Bikram class and the teacher's like uh you know grab your heel H-E-E-L and she just spelled out the word heel in the class and I was like man I was wondering how to spell that and I didn't google it and then the universe just brought it to me in this class uh, another one was I was wondering why doesn't the moon spin? Like everything else in nature like has some rotation to it or, you know, a spiral, like the way a flower grows and the leaves stem off it, the, the leaves grow off a stem and they kind of have this pattern, you know, you've got the sacred geometry and Fibonacci spiral and golden ratio and all that and everything else. And, you know, our arms, when you um, walk, there's a natural, you know, the hip rotates and the shoulder rotates and things. But the, moon it doesn't actually rotate it spins like a spinning plate but it doesn't actually like like perfectly facing us the whole time i just thought that's really curious that it doesn't rotate in the other direction we never see the dark side of the moon and anyway i felt like i got an answer to that one that kind of shook me to the cure core that i wasn't expecting but because i was open-minded um it opened like a whole chapter of my life deeply challenging my beliefs learning about the makeup of my beliefs and where they come from and how much I can, you know, you know, letting go of, again, trust it. You can't, you know, it made me become more self-responsible about where my beliefs come from, you know, and I grew a lot in that process. Um, but I, I would started to experiment a little bit with prayer, you know, just talking um, trying to say thank you for things in the day, for people in the day. Um, I'd even say the Lord's prayer just sometimes cause I didn't know what, I didn't know what, really prayer was i didn't know how to pray. i just thought okay i should pray sometimes i'll talk and then sometimes i was like right as long as i just say the lord's prayer that's my that's me working like i'm i'm going expert i'm just going to say the lord's prayer every night before bed and did that for you know a good chapter as well um because i didn't know that's obviously someone else had written it with intention and it's well written um practiced faith in in a sense without not intentionally but you know in nature i'd go wild camping i'd go 
go for walks. I go for walks occasionally in the woods at night, and just to feel my fear, like with no head torch, and just to like practice faith because. I recognise how much... I stopped watching horror movies years ago. I think once I started getting into spirituality, it just it just kind of melted away. And I just did not get why people would watch horrible stuff at all. And then after a few years of not watching it and then going into woods, you still have a little bit of... Um, you know, a little bit of fear comes up. And then you just, you're just like, well, why is that buried in there? You know, nature's not really doing much. You know, oh, it's all the the Hollywood stuff that you know I watched Blair Witch when I was this when you watch something Seven Beaumont said this the other day if you watch when you were like five or seven or twelve you know young and the first time you come across something horrifying it sticks with you for life like those the first time I watched a horror movie I remember exactly the film I watched it was um don't remember the name of it but I remember <laughs> it was like a twelve A or something was the haunting that was it man that wasn't like looking back it wasn't that scary but it was so scary at the time that sh- that really did something deep and dark to me at the, you know that's hard to undo if you don't process it properly at the time and that just happens so much to a, to to children like you just that's what Net- seven Beaumont said like you leave netflix in the background and it suddenly runs an advert for a horror movie and it, your child in the house sees that they could be mortified for life from that and i just think I mean that was kind of a tangent off from nature but a lot of the horror stuff happens at like lakes and rivers and remote places where there's not many people about and I just think that and I, when I've been out to nature with like London as one time I just remember how frightened they were at night just walking in the country lane um, and I was like oh it's so interesting to observe this this fear arise and it's purely in their heads it's not really based off of much truth um, and so the process of undoing that, like going out and literally go out for a walk in the dark woods at night, take a torch or, head, you know, if you want, but turn it off for a period and just see what bubbles up inside you, you know, things like that. Um, so it's something that you could, you could essentially practice seeing where you have fear and then testing it, um, as I think Seb was the first person I would say this again, false ex- fear is false expectations appearing real. And I've heard divine truth said as well, but yeah, false expectations appearing real. That's fear. Um, one, I remember reading autobiography of a yogi and it's something I always thought about with money. And I think my friend Danny actually had done it before as well, where you just live for a day without any money. And they think, I think they got one, a single train ticket in one direction in autobiography of a yogi when he was a kid with his friend, the child they bought a train ticket one way with no food and they went to a city and they had to eat for a day and get back without any any money and it was just a test for them to put their faith into god that they would get fed and get to transport back and it all kind of worked out for them and i thought yeah that's a, a big one is money you know that's a tough one for people right but yeah give all your money <laughs> give you money away or pay you know put or yeah, that's the one divine truth to be, get paid purely in in donation, rather than, um, you know, a salary or or you know put it in God's hands. Put your how you live in God's hands in a way that's you know that's kind of far into the the level. But it's the little tests of faith, like I said, maybe just you know go to the woods and practice faith in nature, wild camp at night, and see that you wake up the next day and nothing's attacked you. You know, obviously do it at your own risk and. and no, I'm talking from a person who lives in England. Um, it's not my, not don't take my advice literally. Like be, your, you know, be in charge of your own decisions. But yeah, something like that. Um, but if you're at this place where you're willing to go out and try something or like test your your faith in some way, then you've you've already got a, a seed of faith at this point. Or, you know, it may even be a sprouting seed. You know, because you you're you're testing the waters of faith. So there's a, you've got, you must have faith to even test for faith. Um, so then I'd, the next point I'd say is to just, to, you've got to trust the process. You're, you're experimenting, you're, you're exhibiting faith in the fact that you're experimenting, you're looking into these things and that you trusted the process enough just to start. It's going to take some time to develop. Muscles build relatively fast, but, I'm starting to understand, I think, that at a soul level, something that is substantial is going to take longer. Like how long does it take for an artist to become a good artist? Obviously, that's subjective, but an, art, an artist takes, you know, 
20, 15, 20 years are doing it from the whole childhood until they make, you know, the breakthrough or whatever. How long does it take you to learn an instrument to become good? You're not going to expect to do it in weeks or even months. You know, it's going to take years to become a good painter or anything. It's going to take year, real dedication and commitment and daily practice for years. And that that's because these things, creativity and art, is that feels like it comes from a soul level. And it's the same with something like faith. It's working at a soul level. So yeah, it's it's like you learn a language you're going to learn it much faster if you immerse yourself in the culture if you go to the country and just you know you row the boat out and throw the paddles away or whatever so faith that's what faith is about isn't it directly like um you know leap of faith so immersing you the more you can immerse yourself the the more you can stress and stimulate and overwhelm it to grow the more as faster it'll grow and the more it'll grow but it's still going to be a, a real long process of ebbing and flowing in, in and out of it um of thinking about it and then forgetting about it and working on it and not working on it but at a soul level you know there's the potential that we're actually dealing with we're dealing with eternity here <laughs> if that you know who knows but that if we're dealing with eternity then you know it's, it's got to be earned you know doesn't just come in one prayer all flooding in you may get moments where you feel like peak faith but it's going to be ebbs and flows and how strong it feels over time you're going to know if it's trending upwards or if it's stagnating now is the time for me when it's feeling particularly strong after some recent experiences hence my timing of this talk Um, but yeah after that then now you've got some faith, like so you feel like you've got some substantial faith if you you know if, if you've done the right work and it's it's working and you're observing it in your life after some practice, some months, years, the sensitivity builds to kind of a more ethereal sense um the seed feels like it's grown into something more substantial though you still may tune in and out of it for periods of your life where you go for weeks and months where you're like really committed and then, you know, something else comes about and knocks you out of it and then you leave it and you focus on work for a bit and stuff like that. It's still going to be a bit in and out. But you start to get a sense at this point for what truth, like deeper truth feels like. Because you've done all the different things and you've experimented with things in your life, you're starting to discern. Now, by the way, just to caveat, I'm not recommending other people to experiment with plant medicines. I want to make that clear. And other things. I'm just sharing the journey that I've been on. I feel like I've, I've got a. I can offer advice differently now from the other side of it to avoid certain traps and pitfalls. Um, and hopefully, I'll get into that in a, in a minute. But I just want to, while I've thought about it, you know, make that point. But um, you start to have faith with more direction, faith that feels connected to more substance, faith in a bigger picture, faith in the spiritual laws at play in this realm that are at play on everyone. So once you have sort of faith in the spiritual laws, it stops you wanting to, you know, play karma police and fight for justice so hard because you recognize that it's not your job and that they're going to, at some point, at some level, the spiritual law is going to act on everyone for for the way they've acted. And it, so it helps you find more peace with that, which is a really, you know, it's it's not a fixed thing but it's a growing thing and it's 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 nice to observe it once it grows in you that you're less judgmental or um attached to other people's ju- justice that other people have to face you know um and you you know you're not even and it's you know eventually it grows to a point where you're not like you don't feel you feel sorry for them that they're gonna have to face the spiritual laws you know you have more faith in nature you can go out you know I go wild camping on my own um, more more often and with enjoy actually enjoying it, you know, not, there's no, not getting over like doubts and fear. It's just like enjoying the freedom and the space. Um, you have faith that you can start to be, start to have faith that you can actually be free, like be a free human. Um, but that it's, it's up to you and not anyone, anyone else. And it depends how you choose to spend your time, and what you devote your life to. Um, faith that, that there is a higher power that just grows stronger and that's again that's another one to observe because it just 
helps you become less attached to this world as everything needs to work out in my life right now in these next five years otherwise you know I'm going to get older and then I'm going to die and there's nothing it's like well there's something else at play here you know you created for a reason you know we're, we're you start to have faith in the, you know that's the way I see it that it's a being that created us created me that loves me that appreciates me but it is the real me and not the fake me the what the fake me that I created to avoid my own pain and then faith that I can deal with the pain that I am avoiding like I said before faith in that the you know sort of the hint of it anyway life after death that was such a huge one that as that's sunk in and it's still sinking in but as that faith grew in life after death um and that took years lots of questions lots of research lots of undoing but the value in that single belief alone is it's been huge for me especially at this time you know when it, you feel like well if the, i can imagine if people feel like this is the only life we've got and what is happening on earth today um but you know all the what's kicking off in the world that that would that was really tough that's tough to deal with like but to know that for me that there's for all of us but for you know to know in myself that this isn't the end that okay that can happen for now but then beyond that they don't have the same control over myself and that you know i still feel like it's my responsibility now to to take care of my life but even more so in the afterlife in the hereafter um but yeah i want to do a whole episode on that on the spirit world um because i think i've got i've done a lot of cool research to share i think so after after that yeah faith will give you or it's given me purpose and direction it's helped me focus more on matters of the soul where i really feel like i'm working at much more of a root level than when i was just focused on just the physical and it's changed help me to make different choices in life and to have different goals in life it's it's just stirred things up at a level that you know fortunately but in a sense i've i've earned it with the way i've lived is i've had a career based off a passion from the from the beginning from when i left school and so i've it hasn't been such a big leap for me and i can imagine that being a tough step for some people if they're in a career that they chose because it it paid them the it just paid them well and so they went into it for the money and then they're starting to get into spirituality and you know have faith in other things and starting to recognize that you know maybe they're not in the greatest place of service that they feel that they could be if they followed their passions and so i can imagine that that'd be quite challenging um, for people but that's something that's gonna you're gonna have to face and that's that will, if you want to if you go down that path that you may have to face, you know, life choices that challenge you at your core, you thought you were doing the right thing, but actually, you know, you were just doing the right thing to make money or, um, or you thought you were serving people, but actually we recognize now that that's not actually that healthy, the thing that you're teaching or sharing, you know? Um, and this next one's nice because it just shows that it gets easier. Faith begets more faith. It builds, it, spirals it it brings more peace more truth more humility and it yeah it gets easier um because it's the start it's the revving of the engine it's the revving of the lawnmower that takes a few revs before it actually gets whirring you know and, but once it's whirring it's going it can it can build on itself if you continue to fuel it um number nine of ten the next point it it will break you down it breaks me it breaks me it broken me down um, it unearths many unloving characteristics in me that I developed, many unloving actions that I'd done, uh, which, yeah, get into an, <laughs> that. That's one to do. I mean, that essentially you could call it sin, um, my sins. And that can sound very religious or, you know, biblical to people. But from what I'm learning from divine truth, sin is just to miss the mark of love now if you think of it like that to miss the mark of love okay well i've missed the mark of love a lot right I've, you know had angry shouting matches with my parents and um you know 
had sexual interactions that weren't of the purest kind, you know, many times in my earlier years and definitely unloving actions that I've done and that the cost of that, the pain that that caused to some other human, you know, to actually recognize that, like that's real. That's, that's, I should, I should feel something about that. And if I don't, then that's my own blocks, you know, and it's the feeling of those recognizing the unloving things that I've done and the feeling of the harm that I've done, which is what, which is what helps me. That's remorse. That's the sincere remorse that stops me to do that again stops me from doing that again and until I recognize it it just plays out again and again and that's what faith led me to recognize that but the final tenth point is that it brings it brings me love with with the knowledge the inner knowing that, that God loves me it's a feeling that's stronger sometimes than others for sure at this at the stage where I'm at now and but the the journey helps me to certainly sense, get a glimmer that I'm loved beyond this, you know, and that helps me to love others. I know how committed and up for this, this journey that you have to be. And so it really has lessened my judgment of other people who haven't taken these steps yet. I was so much more judgmental when I thought spirituality was easy. <laughs> That's the thing. And yet it wasn't easy because I was judging people. Um, but then on this path, when, it, when it's actually a much harder, narrower road than I ever thought it was starting out, man, yeah, I, I feel for anyone that's yet to do, do those first you know, steps. It's, it's, but it's worth it is worth every is worth worth every bit because it's ah because it's that because it's letting go because it's <laughs> it's detachment from pain but not ignoring it but really but fully releasing it fully feeling it and releasing it and so it's less of a it's more of a figment of, of memory than it once was, I mean, like I say, still so much more to do, but when you take a step, I feel like I took a step and it was, it's, I wouldn't want to be on any other path right now. So one of the channeled messages from Jesus this is actually in a book, the Paget Messages or the um, Divine Angelic Revelations of Divine Truth. I absolutely love that title. Angelic Revelations of Divine Truth. Like it's so precise and like, <laughs> boom, what it is. Um, it says on the tin. But it, this is, there was a, f a lot of different people channeled through into through James Paget um, into that book. But this one was from Jesus and it directly relates to faith. And this is probably more direct to what people think faith may be. Um, faith is that which when possessed in its real and true meaning makes the aspirations and longings of the soul a real living existence and one so certain and palpable that no doubt will arise as to its reality. So I think that one speaks to manifestation, like the faith of that you right, This is what I want in my, in my life and it will come if I can hold faith. Now there's, there's um, booby traps on the way with that because if if what you want with the true meaning that you have faith that you're going to get isn't aligned with love but you still get it it's not really going to serve your highest good but if if what you want is loving and it's you have the strongest faith on it then the, like the longings of the soul are, are really real, then it will just happen. It will appear. It, we, we can make that into reality. In the spirit world, they talk a lot about thought. Thought creates everything. And it seems like it's more so in that place, but it's also available here. Obviously, more time. You can go into the law of attraction and all that, but it's a real thing. It's a very real thing. 
for me, it's made me because I recognize that if, if my desire isn't aligned with love and for me to recognize whether something's aligned with love or not, it's, I'm still not perfectly able to do that. So just wanting things, I'm, I'm hesitant to just long for things right now and just try to focus on myself as much as I can, but that that is an option. And the more you can grow in love and align yourself with love, then and the more you apply faith, the more you know clearly what you want and that it will serve you and the greater good, then the more you can bring that to earth as a reality. And that's the power of it. And that's that's a beautiful thing that one man did that, you know, others have done since in, in lesser amounts, but the more of us that can do it with the right intention, the more we can bring about more peace to this planet. This plain tea. Now I don't still don't follow any religion, um, but I did get it. Like I mentioned, I got into Divine Truth teachings in December of 2019, thanks to Bex, and um, which is a story which I'll tell another time, maybe. And um, but it felt like their teachings gave up, and so this is where I'm at right now. Is is of all the things I've gone through to this point, their teachings gave a backbone to my spirituality it's the logical I feel like the logical firm teachings they talk about the three pillars of spirituality being humility truth and love and when you dive into what each one of them means and they break it down it it just so I just love it I just, the fact that it's just these three pillars but they're each so strong a pillar that if you can you know recognize work and way each of them and each one of no, humility feeds truth and truth feeds love that's uh, that needs to be broken down a bit more which i'm not going to do now but it, i've just not heard anyone talk about spirituality in that sense in, in, in sim not in simplified but then there's so much depth to that to what that is you know um to really understanding love and and truth and humility and i just yeah that Again, I'll, I'll talk about it more in the future, but I just wanted to share that. That's where I'm, I'm, I love what they're, they're teaching. And it's it's honest, hard spirituality in a sense. Like it's um, not spiritual bypassing or just, yeah, love and light, everything's good, you know, just peace. But it's actually like really self-reflective and... tough you know tough but transformative um it just tied so many things together for me like it offered clarity for me on what had worked in the past and why it had worked and what hadn't worked and why it hadn't worked and you know most things in the past hadn't worked the way i may have for a short period in a honeymoon period um or through placebo or whatever a lot of things felt like they worked for a short period and then had no lasting effects Whereas this helped me to see clearer what was true and what to discard. And it, it, I feel it helped me to discern better for myself and offered me new truths to then discern as well and experiment with. And I feel like since studying that and, um, you know, ebbing and flowing even with that, but it, I feel like it accelerated my faith, like pulled into like a, just floating along in the river and then into like a, <laughs> into the, rapids suddenly hit the rapids with that stuff um it rocked me massively in moments and i learned a lot about myself i've still got much more to learn about myself and much more to so much more i'm just you know tip of the iceberg but the levels that like i talked about earlier of unlovingness in within me and insincerity within me arrogance that i just had no idea <laughs> i just had no idea about these things i just thought yeah I'm a lovely human with good intentions and people just don't get me. Not quite, Tim. No, this is, this is, a, <laughs> this is a, yeah. And I didn't think I was perfect or God's gift or anything, but still, I, th I thought I understood love and was a lot more loving than I realize now that I actually was. I, yeah, I no idea. And there's been times within that that I even stopped praying altogether um one second need to book something in. yep cool we're back 
Yes, hello. So, yeah, there's times when I stop praying um, because I just doubted my own sincerity of the prayers then. Once I learned more about myself, I was like, man, was I really even like, like longing or intending that prayer without just wanting something for myself, you know, without really caring for the other party involved. Um, it yet yeah, stirred all my previous spiritual knowledge up and it allowed me to revisit it with more depth and to see what really stuck. Like I say, it's the best way I can describe it. It gave a backbone to my spirituality and then I was able to identify, you know, and build around that backbone, that skeleton. So in summary of those those 10 points, starting point, recognize that the, for me, so it might be for you, is, is if you can just recognize or get a glimmer or just a, a gut feeling that there might be something beyond this world, this realm, something beyond the physical. Um, faith is something that I think most of us kind of felt when we were children to some degree, though we may have forgotten what it feels like until you get it back. It might feel like a, a familiar feeling. But it can, I think it often gets lost when children lose faith in adults because adults can break their trust. Um, you know, with lies that they think are so innocent, like Santa Claus, you teach a child that this miracle of a man appear, exists and he comes down your chimney and leaves presents for you. And it turns out for 10 years, or I don't even know how old they go till, but you, you were lying to the child about Santa Claus for 10 years. And then it's like, what? That was such a miraculous, wonderful story of my childhood. That was a highlight of the year. And yet it was a lie. Like, how can I trust the adults on other stuff? You know, it's, it's a wild one. That is for me that is so common. But anyway, and then the child projects, projects this onto God. If I can't trust adults, they see God as the ad, an adult figure as well. And they project, oh, well, I can't trust God. And it, so often it, you have to do some real deep diving to sometimes recognize that, that we don't, many of us don't trust God because we just, we put our parental figures into, into how he is as well. Um, and think that he's, if they're oh, okay, maybe there is a God, but he's angry or wrathful or judgmental. And it's, it's not the case. Well, potentially not the case doesn't seem to be for, from my perspective, but, um, yeah. So after, the starting point then is, is letting go of being so locked into the material world. That's, that's the path that I recognize for, for me that's just sharing in case it helps, but it doesn't mean like to be a recluse to let go of the material world. You still be in the world, enjoy the world, but just letting go of it is like the be all and end all of, of life as you start to, you know, maybe recognize that it's not the solution to everything. Um, and in that place, you're going to feel a bit lost. Or you might be in there right now where you're feeling a bit lost. Um, and so I just encourage to study and experiment and challenge yourself. You know, maybe go to church, uh, go to a spiritualist church. I've been going to both lately. It's been quite nice, spiritualist church, some mediumship sessions. and been going to normal church on a Sunday morning, like tomorrow. Um, and it's been the highlight of my week, to be honest. But again, like I say, I'm not Christian, but I can just go to that place. I can feel the love in that place. I can talk to God, sing to God, uh, feel gratitude, meet people that would, that don't judge you or don't feel judgment from them. And it's such a nice experience. You could just go to church. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to, you can be new and see how you get welcomed. Um, so yeah, study experiment, obviously be wary. I'm not yeah, I wouldn't say from this perspective now, I wouldn't recommend plant meds. Um, with the divine truth teachings, it's all about emotions and understanding emotions and working through emotions, stored emotions, traumas from child. I will go into this in more detail. I'm just skimming on it for now. But yeah, pray, you know, experiment with prayer, ask questions to God or to spirits or to no one, just ask, just put it out there. Um, but if if you do this and you do notice that your faith is growing a little bit that you 
may recognize as a higher power with a bit more clarity. You might just start to trust the process and you're actually practicing faith a bit more now. And it starts to give you a different purpose, which may actually change your life, which may be shocking and break you down a little bit and challenge you. But then on the other side of that challenge, you will just have a little bit more of yourself. You will be a little bit more of your full self, of your true self, of the real you. And you will sense that. You will know that that's there. You have a bit more peace and a bit more clarity, a little less judgment, a little less desperation. And allow it to build then. You might feel a little more motivated to practice it even more. And so the, for me, the two most important points during the process, when you're, if you're experimenting and studying, is there love, real, real natural love? Now, that might be hard to identify at first, but you can try with what you, your understanding of it, where it's at. Is there real love here in these teachings, in this philosophy, in this place of worship, in... Um, whatever it is in this book that I'm reading, like whatever it is, is there love here? Does it feel loving or is there an agenda or is there a, a using fear to control or projection or, you know, so that's one thing, very important sense for the love. And the other one that I would s strongly recommend that it involves, is it working on a relationship with a creator? If there is one, is, is that, that for me, that, that, that as a focus, when that became a more pertinent priority, more things started to happen in my life. So I think sense for the love and working in a relationship to a creator or a God, if there is one, and you can ask that question um, with sincerity, not to prove a point, just curious, be a curious child. Um, and faith, it begins with hope. Before faith, I think you have to have a bit of hope. And I can see that sinking right now in the current times. As fear rises, hope uh, tends to fall. But this has helped me a lot lately to focus on faith and cultivating faith. Here's one thing that I learned lately. God doesn't give us things. He gives us opportunities and I think that's so, that's rung in my head a lot lately. Because many of us are asking for freedom, myself included. Like, I've been, you know, why are you taking our freedoms with these passports or whatever? Well, I'm learning to be free right now. <laughs> I'm learning. This is an opportunity where I'm learning because I'm being challenged in a place where I had a, an emotional block of, like, thinking freedom was a physical thing. And now I'm being taught that it's not, just a physical thing it's a different the process is different from that and that's a, all a, a mirage to think that it can be taken away because it's not dependent on that you can lose your travel on earth forever and i'm actually coming to terms that that might be the case for me but freedom's you know it's a state of mind it's a place of peace in the heart which is brought on by faith i had a Khalil Gibran, Gibran quote on the last one, the poet. Actually, the more I study his stuff, I actually think he's really on the money with a lot of stuff. But here, there's just a short quote about freedom from his book, The Prophet, that I remembered and I found it again. Um, For me, you can only be free when even the desire of seeking freedom becomes a harness to you. And when you cease to speak of freedom as a goal and a fulfillment... You shall be free indeed when your days are not without care nor your nights without a want and a grief, but rather when these things girdle your life and yet you rise above them naked and unabound. So he's saying there when you stop speaking of freedom as a goal, then you're free because if you're chasing freedom, you're obviously not free. And that when, not when everything's perfect, you're free, but when everything's challenging you in life, and yet you rise above those challenges naked and unabound. That's when you're really free. And I thought he's actually really on the money. And it just made me, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This chasing and fighting for freedom thing. Yeah, no, that's, 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 you can't get it through fighting, you know. So if, if like me, you feel uncomfortable 
uneasy about the situation that's going off right now. You want the right to choose with your own body. You don't want something injected that you don't know how safe or you necessarily trust the intentions of the people that are pushing it. And you may be letting go of the right to travel to a foreign country, which has, has helped me to feel free in the past. Um, but often I maybe was just running away from my life here. Some At some point in the history, we couldn't have traveled anyway. Like The majority of our ancestors didn't have the options that we have. Um, they can take away your freedom to travel, but they can't take away your ability to work on developing your soul wherever you are. Like they can't, that's, that's what I really came to realize. They can take away my freedom to travel, but wherever I am on earth, as long as I'm in a sober mind, I can develop, I can work on developing my soul. And that is such a beautiful feature that God has designed into this place into this realm that wherever you are you you can still work on your soul development and working on your soul is what i'm coming to see is the thing that will bring you everything that you want anyway health happiness love in the long run it's a lot of breaking down and stored emotions to one earth line in the path on the way but that's one of the greatest verses in the Bible, I think. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and all else shall be given to you. And the more I focus on that, the more I grow in the right direction. <laughs> or as Rose Namayunas said the other, you know, a few months ago, actually, in the previous uh, event, but she said, the most important thing is to get right with God first. <laughs> and I just love the way she said that. I was like, yep, yeah, the most important thing is to get right with God first. And that's how, that's how I feel as well, Rose. So you can be, you can literally be in a physical prison, in a cell with four walls and still work on your soul, on your faith, on your relationship with God and find more peace than people who you may deem most free already, like the billionaires, you know, playing astronaut. You can be in a prison and be more free than them if you, God's, God's designed it that way so that you have that option to do that. The only way I can see can see it not being not being able to work on your soul um, through faith is when you're not of a sober mind, which is why in my eyes I come to realize you know the sort of risk with the psychoactive plants and alcohol, or the big pharma drugs like people take like antidepressants and all sorts of you know you know mind altering stuff, physical altering stuff, and then. Or them even right down, just to be precise and honest, the mood altering stuff that people take that isn't necessarily labelled a drug, but that they have on a daily basis, like it's normal, sugar, coffee, chocolate, which many people take purely to uplift themselves. But that's avoiding the truth of how they're actually feeling in that moment. Because like, right, I feel down, so I'm going to take this to alter myself from the truth of what I'm feeling that, you know, just to like I say, be precise that you're, you're changing your mood. You're taking something to alter your mood from the truth. So it's just a step away from actual freedom that the truth brings of your ability to, to process things or, you know, I'm not, you, you do what you want, but that that's something I've come to recognize and it's help. It's give that understanding that has given me strength, to step away, to give up sugar and chocolate. And I never really had chocolate, coffee or anything, but all the psychoactive plants and everything. Under coming to that understanding helped me to move away and just to be... When I was a child, I used to just think, why do adults drink alcohol? Why do people smoke cigarettes? I don't get it. And then you get to your 20s and you start joining in and you're like, oh, yeah, it's kind of all right, actually. It's not that bad. And then now the more I'm like, man, I was on the money when I was a child. <laughs> and um, it's nice to start getting back to that place where I just can live that truth and see that again you know as as in for what it is or the other way that the other only other way that we don't work on it because you can take yourself out of sobriety but if you're in a prison of emotions that is another place where you're not able to work on your soul and by that i mean not being humble to your true emotions because you can be in if you're in real emotions, processing emotion, that's it. But you're not in, you're not in a prison. Then. But if you're in fake emotions, you're imprisoning yourself in these these the, these uh, not humble, like 
not true feelings you're acting out in facade emotions like righteous anger which is so easy to come to when looking at the news and believing what many of us may believe that's a quick place to come to righteous anger and that's not a humble emotion and therefore we're kind of imprisoning ourselves in uh, judgment and projective emotions onto other people rather than recognizing that that's the cover-up for the sadness that's within many of us for for me in that my instance is, is the sadness of loss of something i believe i is my right to have i believe it's my right to this and you're taking it away so you're being but it's unloving for me to expect them to give me freedom in a way you know it's I'm trying to get my head around that one but yeah it's helping me not to be so uh, righteously angry about it all it does seem fairly clear to me and perhaps many of you that the people making the decisions to restrict and limit our freedoms like i just talked about based on who or hasn't had a, a jab is is quite likely money related or possibly even more insidious right which is a brutal truth potentially a brutal truth and like, like just like um the military when they brought the tsa the secure airport security came came in and there's a military contract lots of money to the military the same feels like a similar thing it's about money getting contracts to these people and there's a lot of the politicians and their partners have shares and a lot of the pharmaceutical companies providing the solutions and <laughs> It appears even increasingly though that even the problem in the first place was man-made funded by the same people who we kind of trust in to fix it um and the solution that's getting found by research which was funded by taxpayers money and then it's sold by private companies for over 40 times the markup and then all the all that 40 times profit markup is going to the private businesses and not back to the taxpayers money who funded the research it does it does seem quite corrupt and yet that's nothing new to humanity that that you know tyrannical powers in charge treat everyone else this way and it's just how it kind of nothing new under the sun at the moment until we till we all stand up but what is stand up stand up is not protest in the street stand up is is deal with our shit <laughs> sorry to swear but to to grow to actually grow because there's, there's not really grown up I, don't, I just don't see grown-ups where are the grown-ups there's just there's not many grown-ups is there like really truly there's just a lot of of children who think being selfish just being self-serving and they've gotten into a position where they can be incredibly self-serving at the cost of everyone else on the planet and it, I mean, there are some people with, you know, I'm sure there are many people that work as people in these companies that are working for the pharmaceutical companies and within government that absolutely have the best intentions and are believing in what's going on and they're, they're, they're doing their best for humanity in the way that they see fit, you know, and that's 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 cool, man like that's that's not for me to to judge that at all but it's it's i'm obviously a little frustrated at the situation i used to feel a lot more angry about it now but i feel i've worked through some of it i've learned how much the anger wasn't serving me and starting to have faith in in the spiritual laws that are at play on me um i even had a dream that i was going to get on a train and I couldn't get on it because there was uh, I needed the COVID passport or something to get on the train, and I just didn't get on. I was like, okay, I wasn't even mad. I just didn't get on the train within the dream. And I always I like in dreams because dreams are a test of how you really feel because you can't fake you can't act fake in a dream. If you if you if you want to do something in a dream, you end up doing it. Even if you're like in real life, I would never have done that. You wake up and you're like, why did I do that? But that's because in your heart you were like, that's okay. But in the in the dream world, you kind of know. And in the dream, I wasn't even mad. Like I was like, oh okay, oh I went to go through the barriers. No, you have to go around and do that big queue. Okay, no, nah, I'm gonna go somewhere else. Then. So that's what that's very much in my awareness and peripheral right now is the you know the boundary that's getting feels like it's shrinking phys, in the physical world. It's shrink. It seems appears as though it's shrinking. But I 
I'll just work within the boundary that I'm given. No, tr- you know, maybe no travel abroad. Okay, no concerts. Fine, I'm not that into that. No restaurants. Sure, I'm I'm cool with no restaurants, man. Um, like this could get this could get worse. I don't know how far it's going to go right now. Okay, but my anger doesn't solve that either way. Uh, I've even had a few friends that have messaged me mentioning that they know people who can get me put in a system if I wanted to get a you know passport a you know jab passport but I I don't want to lie man (laughs) I don't want to be deceitful like I don't want to have to be deceitful to have freedoms that are God-given right that I believe are God-given rights so but if people are restricting our rights knowingly deceptively and to make money or something even more harmful to humanity how I feel about it doesn't really change the costs that they already face as the spiritual laws impact on them and their souls. So why let them take my sort of imaginary freedom and my peace as well? If I have one job in all of this to maximize what I can get from this tough situation in the really realist way and it's to focus on my own soul's development and use what is happening as an opportunity to heal to face what's inside that's manifesting in the outside world for all for many of us this is a, a collective consciousness manifestation for many of our, our deep fears of to do with freedom and being forced off and so god grants opportunities I've been asking and searching for healing for years with many dead end roads. And maybe this was the sign I or we needed to get the message. The goal is to heal to a point where I feel compassion to the humans doing this to the world that they feel so little love in their life that they are so desperate that they would act like this. And to those you know, having their arms bent or being duped or turning a blind eye to also allow what's happening. Try, I want to also, you know, try to recognize the good natured people within there, you know, like I mentioned earlier, working for the companies that are none the wiser and they're just trying to help, to help as well. Like sometimes I overlook them people. But if, if I, we really are children of God, right? That, that might sound to some people like just overly dramatic or too religious or something. But if you can just, you know, allow the the judgment in your head, if you can, and just, just to like tune in to the, an understanding of this, if we are children of God and so too, we'd embody the three pillars of spirituality as divine truth teach in my eyes, humility, truth, and love. How would we act? Well, for for me, I I wouldn't project my anger and I'd attempt to get to my true feelings that the anger is covering up because that's a more humble way to deal with my emotions. I would not lie to get around the situation because I would be striving to stand in truth. And uh, finally, I would forgive the people, either those were presented on TV or in the news or, you know, in government or working for the pharmaceutical or those that we can't see behind the curtain like the Wizard of Oz. No matter how unloving what they are doing may be, I would forgive them because that's what love would do. And that forgiveness would be effortless. If, you know, if I was in the full knowing and faith that I am a child of God, now I'm not in that place. I have a lot of work to do on all three to get there. But I have a vision and an aim, you know, and a direction and an understanding. And I've got enough faith now to fuel my next step in that direction. So I know that's the direction that, okay, that's what love would do. Okay. Well, I'm not there yet. I've still got work to do, but at least I have a direction and I've got, that's a compass. I've got a compass in this, 
you know, crazy times right now. And that's all you need. I can't remember what book it was in or where I heard this reference, but it was saying if you're driving from the East Coast of America to the West Coast at night time and you set off, when you set off, say you're going to California, you can't see California. You know, you can't at all see California. You've got your headlights on. You can see 50 feet in front of you. But you have faith that that 50 feet in front of you, as you get 50 feet further, you're going to be able to see 50 feet further than that. And so you drive from the east to the west coast without being able to see ever more than 50 feet at a time, but you can make it, you know, thousands of miles. That's faith. That's that's all you need to set off. You know where you're headed. So studying, learning, trying to understand what love would do, and then trying to unearth all the roadblocks in the way to that. That's what faith encourages me and guides me to do. In the heavens, if it is a real place in the spirit world, which I'm coming to believe now far stronger than I've ever ever believed it before, the celestial beings who inhabit that must feel a true sense of freedom beyond what I think any of us can come close to fathoming where they have let go of every last ounce of fear. In the heavens, they have fear's antidote. Faith. Fear's antidote. In the heavens. <laughs>